Welcome to The Real News Network. I'm Sharmini Pires coming to you from Baltimore. The Ebola epidemic continues to spread rapidly in Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone. If the virus continues to surge in the three worst affected countries and spread to the neighboring countries, the two-year regional financial impact could reach $32.6 billion by the end of 2015, says the World Bank. Economic activity in West Africa has come to a virtual standstill because of Ebola. Markets, centers of commerce, and cross-border activity is halted in order to contain the virus. How will these countries cope with this kind of a price tag to protect the people? The people of the West African nations will, over the next few years, have to rely completely on the international community for their survival and livelihood. How much of that price tag will come from the World Bank and the IMF group? Let's have a look at what the president of the World Bank had to say, Jim Yong Kim. Just announced that the World Bank group will uh, raise uh, as much as $200 million to support Guinea, Liberia, and Sierra Leone in their efforts to battle the Ebola uh, epidemic uh, that has broken out in those three countries. Uh, this money will go for very basic uh, support for medical supplies, medical staff, and also to help uh, with uh, people who are f facing economic hardship as a result of this epidemic. We want to stress that we're doing this under the leadership of the World Health Organization. Uh, when I was working at the World Health Organization in 2003 at the tail end of the SARS epidemic, we learned several things. One, these epidemics can happen anywhere. And two, when they do happen, the world community has to respond to put in place those systems that can pre prevent these kinds of uh, outbreaks from happening again. Uh, we have a responsibility uh, to that particular region of Africa. We're going to do everything we can, not only to uh, provide support in the short term, but to really think about building the kind of public health systems uh, that the people of those three countries uh, deserve. Now joining us to discuss if that is an adequate response on the part of an organization that is set up to respond to economic development and financial needs of developing countries is Ni Akute. Ni is coming to us from Washington, D.C. Ni is a Ghanaian-born policy analyst and activist. Akute is the founder of Democracy and Conflict Research Institute, and he is the former executive director of Africa Action and editor of Trans Africa. Thanks for joining us, Ni. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Ni, do you think this is an adequate response on the part of the World Bank? Um, I, I, I don't think so, because for one thing, it simply is not enough to contain the virus as well as it, you know, directly hold the virus and as well as the economic repercussions that, that you mentioned. So it certainly, if, if it's not enough medicine to address the disease, but I think the additional factor is that the reason that these three countries have been, so, have been hit so hard, in my very strong opinion, the World Bank and the IMF have, have contributed to the weak uh, health systems in Africa which is why Ebola hit so hard. So therefore, so to speak, they contributed to the problem. Therefore, they need to own up to their mistakes and they need to do more to help rescue these countries. What do you mean by that? What role has IMF and the World Bank played in West Africa in the past? Oh, well, you know, two phrases. One is structural adjustment programs. Anybody who's been studying Africa since independence, especially since the 80s when... Uh, Ronald Reagan got into power in the United States and the World Bank and the IMF actually made themselves the economic stewards of economic policy in Africa. Structural adjustment, otherwise called uh, austerity measures, um, they have imposed these policies on the, on the African countries regardless of what the people want, regardless of what the uh, uh, leaders wanted. So structural adjustment is... Uh, is, is one of those phrases, and the governments were told, were forced, that in order to get a good mark from the World Bank and the IMF, you have to keep government small, you have to slash government officials' pay. After you have slashed the number of government officials, you have to privatize everything, and you have to force people to pay, and especially to pay for health care, 
and to pay out of pocket for education. So I think those structural adjustments went on for, for decades and they devastated the, the African economies. The other phrase uh, that I wanted to throw in is IMF uh, uh, riots. This actually came from Africa, where every time the IMF would impose economic uh, uh, conditions, ordinary people in the street were so hit hard that they would riot. And so it actually created a new phrase in the English language and in economic writing, IMF riots. So, Ni, nee, um, explain more in the sense that, yes, of course, the IMF uh, would have this, you know, horrendous austerity policies and neoliberal economic policies and, you know, force governments to shrink uh, their bureaucratic and civil service. Um, all these things, you know, in the past were set up in order to service uh, their people. Yes. But why are they forced to come to these kinds of agreements uh, with the World Bank and the IMF? I think that's a great question, because on the surface of it, a, a, a government, a country, can simply say, sorry, your conditions are too harsh. Uh, we, we don't have to deal with you. After all, the United States doesn't take the advice of uh, the World Bank and the IMF. A number of big countries don't. But for African countries, number one, they are, they, they are economically small and weak. Secondly, having just gotten out of colonialism, I know this is about 50 years ago, but when you are trying to restructure economic systems uh, that was built over more than a century, it is not easy. And so they are tied into the global economy. They are tied into their former uh, um, colonial masters, that is especially France and the U UK, and they are tied to the United States. Now, those three countries, uh, the United States, the UK, and France, play a major role in the World Bank and the IMF. And therefore, the World Bank and the IMF actually act as policemen and gatekeepers for the entire global economy if you are an African country. Because the rest of the global economy says to you, we will deal with you only if the World Bank and the IMF says you are well behaved. And the, and the World Bank and the IMF will say you are well behaved only if you agree to their conditions. And therefore, it's it almost impossible for an African country to say, listen, I, I don't want to do this anymore. You know, everybody who reads the news, uh, African news, especially U.S. Africa, will know that the West uh, doesn't much care for Robert Mugabe. And usually you will be told that, it's because he's internally repressive and other things. But I happen to think that one major factor also is that for about 10 years after Zimbabwe became independent, Robert Mugabe followed the dictates of the World Bank and the IMF very closely. And after about 10 years, he said, no, this is not working no more. Um, for instance, they made Zimbabwe sell its stock of uh, maize and say, you know, it's uneconomical to hold it, sell it, buy it when you need to, when you need it. But that was bad economic advice because when they wanted to buy it, they had to pay more. And so I am saying that countries that defy the IMF and the World Bank get punished by the larger global economy. And therefore, it's not been very easy for, for those countries to reject what the World Bank and the IMF recommend because they were doing it on behalf of the global economy. But these countries are very resource rich. Uh, yes. I mean, places like Sierra Leone has diamonds and gold and uh, West Africa is considered one of the, you know, natural resource rich regions of the world. Um, the, the World Bank, you know, adopting this, these policies is really opening the doors and the gates to a flood of corporations coming in to do business in the region and wreak the resources out of the region and leave very little behind. Can you sort of describe this complex relationships uh, between the World Bank, the IMF, the local governments, the corporations that have left the conditions that they have left in the region that is now unable to cope with a basic uh, I shouldn't say basic, but a, a grave uh, epidemic of Ebola in the region? I, I think that that question is, is uh, uh, fantastic. I mean, because 
The reason that the World Bank and the IMF do what they do, the reason that they squeeze the African countries and say to them, you do what we tell you, never mind what your own people might want, never mind what your own leaders might want. The IMF and the World Bank, there's a method to their madness. And I believe that the, 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 the method, the reason they do what they do is actually to make it uh, um, safe and, and, and hospitable for international corporations to go in and plunder Africa as well. It is as simple as that. Now, it's been going on for years. The IMF and the World Bank are creatures created after the Second World War, the Bretton Woods institutions. So they just came in after the Second World War with um, the UK and Western Europe being weakened. They were created to help uh, stand up against the global economy. So they took over what has been done, which is plundering Africa's wealth, leaving very little for the Africans under whose feet the world is. And so you, you are so right. That question goes to why this is done. The World Bank and the IMF will tell the African countries, keep government small. You can't afford. I mean, when I was in school, our governments were being told, listen, I'm from Ghana. You are a small country. The United States doesn't invest this much into education, so why should you? You shouldn't invest in education. Let parents pay for it. When most parents are poor and when education is an investment. So they want to keep government small. They want the people of the country to get as little as possible from the wealth. The bottom line is because they want their, uh, uh, the Western corporations to take, continue taking the wealth from out of Africa. That is precisely why they do it. Even as recently as in Liberia, when uh, Ms. Ms. Johnson Sally, whom, whom I know well because she was my boss at, 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 at a certain point, when she became president, she, she got a lot of kudos from the West because, you know, she's well known in the West and it was great that a woman had been elected president in Africa. But behind the scenes, she was told that, listen, you will get a lot of corporations investing if you don't insist that they clean up the environment, if you don't push hard for labor protections, if you don't uh, uh, insist on high taxes. So all the things that the World Bank and the IMF says, I'm saying your question is great because it goes to the heart of it. It's designed to make it easier for Western corporations to plunder Africa. It's as simple as that. Ni, I, I want to thank you for joining us today and explaining all of this. And I'm hoping that you will come back and keep us posted so that we could uh, use this uh, very dire and sad situation of uh, the Ebola crisis to really open the hearts and minds of the people around the world to what's really been going on in the region prior to all of this. I, I thank you very much for having me. And I think that um, after, you know, containing Ebola is important, but this issue goes beyond that because after Ebola is contained, there has to be how do we rebuild healthcare system so that this doesn't happen again. And so we need to understand how the healthcare systems became weak. And then for those like the World Bank and others who, who contributed to it, they must be held accountable so that they can be made to help rebuild the system. They must not get away with hiding their mistakes. Thank you so much, Ni. Nee. Thank you. And thank you for joining us on the Real News Network.